So with a further note that you have already received. <coughs> I set out the reasons very clearly and the fact that I decided to take this action many months ago for those reasons. As to the precise timing, I would draw your attention to my references to this unique moment between the acceptance of the counter-inflation policy announced in July last year and the timetable for discussion directed to agreement on a new policy this summer. I have described it as being on a hinge now between the acceptance of last July's policy and the negotiation of a new policy. And had I delayed further, for example, gone in the spring, that timetable could have been prejudiced by people's minds being diverted and also by the fact that this would have happened at a time when the union conferences and so on were happening. I hope, therefore, it is not necessary for me to spend too much time on some of the speculative reasons I find have already been advanced since 11.30 this morning, speculative reasons which bear no relation to the facts. For example, my decisions bear no relation to recent events such as those in Parliament last week. The timetable had been decided and confirmed well before that. And indeed, today's Cabinet, unusual on a Tuesday, had been put on the list of Cabinet meetings a fortnight ago for this reason. Furthermore, although this is not from me, I heard on the radio from the court correspondent uh, that... Uh, today's, what I knew, confirmation that today's audience had been arranged some time ago. But I do want to say, I am, oh, you must have to do that one, yeah. <laughs> I'm touched by some expressions I've heard and read about my state of health. I am as fit now as I was 20 years ago, but carrying rather less weight. And my regular medical checks by my doctor confirm the fact, I understand, he's gone on the record today that I'm as fit as a flea. Nevertheless, I know <coughs> how solicitous my friends can be, especially my friends in the press, about my state of health. And I'm deeply touched and moved. Two and a half years ago, I had a little knee trouble, which was diagnosed as fluid on the knee. This gave rise to a slight limp. Uh, which was perceived. On the Saturday, the Lord President of the Council was telephoned by the representative of an eminent Sunday newspaper asking him to confirm that I had had a stroke. As it happened, the Lord President knew the exact gravity of my state of health and said slightly inaccurately, though it was on the right line, that I had housemaid's knee. You all remember the first chapter of Three Men in the Boat. <coughs> But the anxieties and solicitude on the part of my friends in the press persisted. Within a few weeks, my office were telephoned as one inquirer after another asked in suitably funereal tone about what they had heard about me on the basis of impeccable evidence, namely that I had had two coronaries, three cerebral hemorrhages, leukemia, lung cancer, and indeed cancer in other less mentionable parts of the anatomy. Could I ask if there is anyone who would like to put a question before you get on the questions about the new Foreign Office appointment? Okay, Charles. Prime Minister, uh, I imagine people are almost shocked by this announcement uh, that, that you've made today. And Can you speak of it? Why aren't you mind about it? Oh, well, I'll shout, sir. Shout, yes. Yeah. Uh, people, uh, I think, are probably very shocked by this announcement today. It was totally unexpected. And there are so many doubts and uncertainties uh, in the country uh, at the present time about the position the country is in, uh, that people must be concerned or feel some uneasiness at the timing of your decision. So what do you say to allay the fears of those who may feel some disquiet and unease that you have chosen this particular time to go. Well, the main reason why they're shocked is that they didn't get on to it, isn't it? <laughs> the main reason they're shocked is there wasn't a leak. But I repeat, 
uh, when we came into office two years ago, I said to a number of people who will uh, verify this, that I didn't intend to stay for more than two years. Even in the summer of 1974, I said I wouldn't stay beyond party conference 75. And I, that was my target date in the event I didn't because of the problems of voting a new leader when the House wasn't sitting. Christmas I thought of, again there was the same problem of a long recess. And although my 60th birthday is no more significant to me than any other, uh, I decided to do it in March, which was just about the two-year limit I had set. You will know that from my statement that the Queen was informed last December, December the 9th, of the exact date I had in mind. It was last week, but all by election though. And uh, you will have heard in the House this afternoon that Mr. Speaker confirmed that I had told him about it. Also, last autumn, uh, naturally I have uh, wrestled with the problem of timing, Michael, ever since. Uh, I've referred to by-elections and things of that kind. But the decisive question for me was, as I've said, many things within the economy are now improving, the, as in my statement, even the moderation in the rise in the rate of unemployment. And furthermore, the anti-counter-inflation policy is fully accepted by the country, and I do not want to interfere by uh, a leadership election with the vitally important negotiation which will start on the budget and will be continuous right through to the summer. Those are the reasons. Go on, Mike, you want to supplement? I, I was only saying, sir, that you, that you have presided with such uh, skill and persuasion over the affairs of this country for so long, and those skills have been indispensable to taking the country through many difficulties. Do you say that your departure at this time will not prove any obstacle to an improvement in the country's position. And do you see it in some way as perhaps helping that person? It could well do so. I think it'd be good to get a fresh look at these problems by a new leader. The one thing I've always rejected in um, politics is the doctrine of indispensability of a particular leader. I have never thought I was indispensable. This is a view that's been shared by some of my colleagues over the years, though they are more united now. It's a view that has been almost unitedly shared by the press over many years. But they have been very kind now. And I've taken the same view about leaders of the Conservative Party over the years. 